I used to be around some real guys that you just don't muck around with people that were doing just madness from a young age, like stabbing people, robbing people. Why would you say Messi is a better footballer than Ronaldo? I look at Messi and that's a God-given talent. Let's be honest, Ronaldo's got an ego. How have you seen the game change? The funny thing is when, when I was coming up, you had to go and really earn your contracts. Now players will get paid because they could potentially be good. It's the World Cup. I've decided to interview a few more footballers from my podcast, including my next podcast guest, a man called Jay Bothroyd. Now he only retired in 2021. He's played for the likes of Coventry, Sheffield Wednesday, Wolverhampton Wanderers, QPR, and many more. He even had one cap for England in 2010. We speak all things on, on the football pitch, off the football pitch, and his predictions for the World Cup. Be happy, never content, and make sure you subscribe. Right, welcome back to the podcast, Steve Sully study. I've been, interviewed a lot of very successful people and driven people. The next guest in front of me, Jay, thank you very much for your time and coming on board. I know this is going to be a sensational episode. It's going to be a lot of value here and I'm quite intrigued about your story, man. Thank you, man. Pleasure to be here. Cool. So quite naturally for people that may not know, there's only going to be a few people. You're ex-professional footballer, retired last year, 2021. Some of the clubs that you play for, not in order, uh, Coventry City, Charlton, Wolverhampton, Cardiff City, QPR, uh, Sheffield Wednesday. Then I knew, I know in 2014, you went over to Asia, played in the mm. Thailand yeah. um, league and also Japan. Yeah. Um, you had one cap for England as well, I think in 2010. And you're, you're actually a product of Arsenal's academy. So there's a couple of things I'm going to ask you about it, but I'm actually going to change up this, uh, this, this interview <laughs> and jump to something which is not actually relevant to you, but I'm trying to get your opinion on it, okay? okay. So, Ronaldo, yeah? Chris Ronaldo, Ronaldo, okay. Ronaldo, right? He is one of the wealthiest athletes in the world. He's got a lot of accolades. I mean, playing for Man United, Juventus, Real Madrid. I mean, I think I've got written down here 80, 818 goals. And the guy is just a machine. But I think the bigger your profile gets, you're more prone for attack. And I've just seen recently, he's just done this interview with Piers Morgan, which is circulating. The, yeah, I see that this morning yeah, as well. Yeah. The, the news and, and, and the press. So first and foremost, just, just like as an ex-former professional player, do you think like when they get so big that everything they do is almost like they're destined to kind of upset people in, in the public or in the media? I mean, is that just part and parcel of being a high profile footballer? I think it depends on the person, to be honest. I was just talking about this this morning with my wife and I was saying that someone like Messi, he's had a, you know, there's been some situations where he got trouble with the law for taxes and whatnot. Um, and obviously there was big problems at Barcelona, mainly, you know, I'd say probably because of his, his salary and whatnot. Um, but the way Messi handles himself, I believe is, is really good. I mean, in my opinion, Messi's, you know, the best ever, but he kind of goes about his things quietly. Um, of course, everyone has different characters. Um, obviously, Ronaldo is a bit more extravagant. He kind of wants to show um, what he's got, um, what his body looks like. We've seen that and, you know, he's, he's done fantastic with it. He's got a great brand. Um, but I think this situation at Man United that he's got, it's a difficult one to be honest for me because I look at I look at it and I say, I always say this, regardless of what Ronaldo says, the general public will probably side with the manager because the manager's always right. The club will always be right. Um, it's very rarely that people will say, no, nah, uh, the manager was wrong. He shouldn't have done that. Um, so I think in this situation, he's got, like you said, he's scored so many goals, been so successful, um, worked really hard. His work ethic is amazing. Um, and I do think both sides could have handled it much better than they did. Um, of course, Ronaldo walking off, like not coming on the pitch. I think that's poor from him. He should mm. know better being a, the ultimate professional. Um, but I think Man United could have handled it better as well. And we don't know exactly. I mean, I haven't even listened to the interview yet. So this is just, I'm just listening to what I see this morning on on, on Sky. Um, but it sounds like he's got, I mean, let's be honest, Ronaldo's got an ego, just like all the best players in the world would have an ego, does have an ego. Um, 
and he doesn't want to sit on the bench and he believes that he's good enough to be starting. To be honest, I believe he should be starting for Man United. Um, he scored 20 plus goals last year or 20 goals last year. Um, this year, he hasn't had the opportunities. Um, not going on pre-season tour, I think was poor from him. That's That started off really badly for him knowing he's got a new manager. Um, but then I look at Man United's performances and I look at the other players that are playing and some of them are not performing well. So he might be thinking, you know, why is he playing and he's not playing well and producing? And when I have played, you know, I've scored, I've done well, I've got an assist. Um, and when you give a player like Ronaldo service, he's going to score. There's loads of chances that I've seen this year from other Man United players that they've missed where I feel like Ronaldo definitely would have scored that. Mm. And he's all about success. He's at the end of his career now. He still wants to score as many goals as he can. He wants to achieve as much as he can. He wants to win leagues, win the Champions League, win cups. And he believes with himself in that side, there's a better chance of that happening. And I think most people does do, to be honest. Mm. Um, and I think that's why he gets so frustrated about being on the bench. Um, as well, I don't think that, it, I think when you look at the Man United squad, a lot of them are really young. You don't have that real middle ground where you know, there's some clubs, you'll have players in there that will put other players in check and say, oh, right, come on, you know, you need to do it. Doing a bit. I, don't, I don't feel like Rashford or Sancho or Dalo or some, one, of, one of these young players is going to approach Ronaldo and say, you can't do that. Um, so there's no one he has to really answer to in the dressing room where you look at the past teams with people like Rio, Roy Keane, um, you know, David Beckham, Giggs, Scholes, they would pull you up and, and say, listen, you can't act like this. This is about the team. And I think that's why at the moment he's having a lot of problems because he's speaking out and no one can really talk to him because of what he's achieved. Mm. He, uh, yeah, putting myself in their, their position as a younger player, someone who hasn't achieved as much as Ronaldo, not even a fraction, you must feel quite intimidated. You know, you've got a big alpha male, you know, dominant person now who's, you know, sometimes getting a bit emotional and getting a bit angry and frustrated, which rightly so, I understand. But for me to approach someone like that and say, hey, you, you need to be, you got to be, you got to be a special type of person yourself. Um, I read, I was making some notes on the interview. I haven't watched it myself. I think it actually airs this week on Wednesday, Thursday, but they leaked something out early. And what he said here to Piers Morgan is, United have betrayed me and made me a black sheep of the club. And this is this was reported today in the Sun newspaper. What, do you, what does he mean by betrayed? I mean, the only thing I can think of is that they've obviously told him something and then not followed through with it. Um, and it could be anything. It could be they promised him signings and then they didn't sign anyone. They could have been, we're looking to get this manager in, then they didn't get him and they went with something else. I see that he was talking about the previous uh, manager saying that he, he wasn't even a coach, he was a sporting director somewhere. And I think when you're Ronaldo, you want to, and Man United, to be honest, a club like Man United, you have a figurehead. You have someone that, like Ferguson, no one messed around with Ferguson. Beckham messed around, sold. Stan messed around, sold. Rorikin messed around, out the door. And Man United always sided with the manager, always sided with Ferguson. I think now, I think players have a lot more power. Um, contracts are so like bulletproof you, you know unless you do something really bad you're not going to get sacked um, <clears throat> but I feel like Ronaldo now if he doesn't be careful he's going to ruin his legacy and that's a sad thing for all the things he's achieved on the pitch if he carries on the way he's going people are just going to remember this part of him at Man United everyone's going to forget about the previous part because yes, he scored goals, but it was like, you know, 15 years ago, more than that. And it's like, people are just gonna remember the most recent things. Mm. 
And even now, like a lot of Man United fans talk derogatory about him, just let him go. Like, this is a legend of your club. One of the, probably the best player in the history of Man United. So it's like, it, it's, it's sad to see the way the fans are talking about him now and the way he's being portrayed. But again, he has, he has been the person that didn't handle his affairs in the right way, like I said, with missing preseason, walking in, not wanting to come on and, you know, speaking down to people and, you know, his attitude hasn't been right and you would expect more of him from much, uh, a such experienced player. Mm. The, um, the other last thing I want to say about this is, uh, according to this, this, this publication I read earlier from uh, Sport Bible, he's set to be fined one million pound bare minimum by Man United. It's only two weeks' wages. <laughs> it is, and it's a drop in the ocean. But but you know you know what I mean about public perception. Yeah. You know, like they're going to read that and think, yeah, look, listen, it's not, not a lot of money to him. It's not a lot of money to a lot of like really high profile athletes. But still, being fined by your own club because you had an interview. It's, it's really dividing, you know, Ronaldo. And yeah, but he's brought his club into disrepute. That's the thing. You can't bring your club into disrepute and expect there to be no consequences. So when he's done this, um, to be honest, I think he's done this because he has a move on the table. He's trying to push himself out of the club now. And the only way he can do that is by causing a stir like this. Now he's not at the club because he's at the World Cup for the next month or so. So he can stir up, the, he can stir the pot be in different surroundings with, his, with the Portugal team and hopefully he can get a move in January. I believe that's what he wants to do because he wants to play every week. And there's been speculation about going back to sporting. I mean, even if he went back to sporting, at least he's going to play Champions League, League football. Yeah. He'll play every week, um, which he wants. And, you know, Portugal, Portugal's not a crap league. Um, it's still, it's still, you know, there's still lots of really good players that come out of there. There's some really good teams that play, play and get results against other big teams. So it's still like a very respectable league, but obviously he wants to play week in, week out. Yeah, I think uh, that observation makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Now you're saying it, it does look like he's engineering it. But I, so obviously he's got all these accolades. I mean, I even looked up, he, according to this publication called Wealthy Gorilla, he's worth $500 million. That was published on the 26th of October, so only a little while ago, Eight, 818 goals. And then I know this is not going to sound so relevant, but I think it is, to, it is slightly because of today's world that we live in with social media. He's probably, I think he's the most followed person on Instagram, 496 million followers. So he's got... All this success, all this accolades, all this experience, all this wealth, all this concentration and pressure on his shoulders, he's the most followed person on, on, yeah. on social media. And then if you look at what happened recently, only a few months ago, he went to see Jordan Peterson. Don't know if you know who Jordan Peterson mm -hmm. is. He's a Canadian therapist. Okay. Um, he's a very, very well-respected man himself. He's got millions of followers. A um, bit like a Tony Robbins type guy mm -hmm. or um, Zig Ziglar, someone like that. You know, motivational mindset coach, ther therapist. And it says here that Ronaldo went to Jordan Peterson for a therapy session to treat his depression. Now, I don't know whether this is true or not, but you can kind of see with Ronaldo having spitting, you know, spitting feathers with uh, Piers Morgan in a recent interview, if you, if you kind of go backwards, yeah. it kind of is now making sense. Yeah, of course. You know, got all this, all this, he's so high profile, then he's gone to see Jordan Peterson for, for depression, and now he's just reacted, reacting massively. Yeah. And apparently he, he approached Piers Morgan for this exclusive interview. So, yeah, just wanted to get more of your take on that, Jay. I mean, <laughs> More money, more problems, right? <laughs> can you be that depressed if you're worth five hundred million dollars? Yeah, of course you can. Of course you can. And I mean, I, I I've spoken to people recently, and it, I mean, listen, he's worth a ridiculous amount of money. But there's other people that was earning like you know fifty, sixty grand a week that have been, you know, to 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 just a, a normal person that works an everyday job. You think about fifty grand a week; it's like a ridiculous amount of money. So, and. I've met people like that. I know people like that that have been depressed, but I didn't know. Any, I didn't know. I wouldn't have told. I couldn't tell. Um, and you don't know what's going inside inside a person's head. You know, money can't buy happiness. At the end of the day, and if he's not happy, um, and he's definitely not happy on the pitch now, 
I mean, that's that's his place of zen. When he goes on the pitch and you're playing week in, week out, you can kind of forget about every... Oh, I'm just talking about me personally. When I go on a football pitch, everything else outside of football, you know, just forgotten. You know, that's my place of zen. That's where I go. And then obviously when you come off the pitch, then, you know, things are different. But of course you can be, you know, unhappy when, you, when you've when you got um, that much money. Um, and those kind of people, they live differently, you know. Like we, you can go outside, you know, I can go outside. Other people can go outside and, and not get harassed. Ronaldo walks down the street, he's going to get stopped. People are going to harass him, take him. Maybe he doesn't like that kind of thing. This is what I was saying about Messi. Messi's, I don't know Messi, and I, but to me, it looks like he goes under the radar much more. Um, he focuses in his football. I'm sure that he has these kind of problems, um, but he goes under the radar where Ronaldo likes to be in your face. So, I mean, he's kind of inviting that attention. He's inviting people to have an insight into his life where you don't really see it so much with Messi. And I talk about Messi and Ronaldo because you know, they've always been competing with each other. One's, you know, out there kind of arrogant, so to speak, and the other one seems really humble. Um, so now when you talk about, you know, these kind of problem and depression, I can understand it because anyone can be depressed. Um, having money doesn't bring happiness. And, you know, obviously having no money brings stress, which ultimately is going to make you unhappy as well. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, I know you mentioned about Ronaldo and Messi. Um, you said about Messi being a better football, footballer, maybe marginally. And I speak to other people, <laughs> also other footballers I've had on the podcast, and they might say Ronaldo. So have why play, would you say... Have they played with Ronaldo, though? Some people have, yeah. <laughs> yeah some, some people have, yeah. Um, why would you say Messi is a better footballer than Ronaldo? Listen, in my opinion... Good let cap, me yeah. let me just say let me let me just say that I know I, I I respect Ronaldo. He's he's fantastic. He's got a great work ethic. He's been consistent over the years. Scored a ridiculous amount of goals in big games. Um, very rarely he's been injured. Um, for his country, he's been amazing. Um, he's he's been very charitable as well so he has done a lot of things that I, I really admire but when we're talking about purely football I look at Messi and that's a God-given talent um, and yes he works hard but things look much easier for him he looks more pleasing on my eye than, than Ronaldo does and I look at him as well from a point of view of me being a forward if you, if you ask me who I would like to play with, I would choose Messi over Ronaldo purely for the fact that I think Messi's more of a team player. He'll score, he's scored just as many, well, around the same amount of goals as Ronaldo. He's a few years younger as well, but he's got like, you know, double the assists, yeah. which tells me that he's more of a team player. You know, Ronaldo pretty much, when he's around the box, he's just thinking about shooting and scoring. And then you look at someone like Benzema, Benzema started to flourish when Ronaldo left. And I think that was due to, I don't want to say that Ronaldo is a bad teammate, but a lot of it was around him. And I think he was a, you know, a little bit greedy to what I like. Whereas I think Messi is just more of a team player or score goals, but he'll give assists as well. He's happy to do both. Um, so that's why I would choose Messi, to be honest. Yeah. Do you know there's some there's some <coughs> great footballers as well, and there's so many to to to, to name over over the over over the years. My my, my favorite football by the way is um, Ronaldo R nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, he's yeah. my favorite footballer. Yeah. I think if he didn't have them injuries, for me, he would have been the best. But in, even now, when I watch him play, I just think he's just a ridiculous footballer. Goals, strength, pace, power. He like had absolutely everything. And when you listen to other Very people true. speak about him, like you hear Maldini, you hear Nesta, like Mourinho, uh, Bobby Robson, like all these people that played in that era, um, Zidane said it's just unbelievable what he could do with a football. And even so that I read an article the other day, Zidane was saying he still watches clips of him now and it's just like, wow, what's this guy doing? You mentioned someone there as well, which I would say I'll put him up there with, with Ronaldo yeah. uh, R9, uh, Zidane. Yeah. I mean, the guy, it was just so skillful yeah. and so determined. Yeah. Like, had that aggression, but he could channel it really, really well. I remember I spoke to Gary McAllister and he was talking about Zidane and he was saying that 
it, it was just ridiculous how, how smooth he was with the ball. You couldn't get the ball off him. Um, you thought you could get there and then he just toes it past you or, or does a, a trick. You know, you give him time, he'll pick past you. You get close to him, he'll roll you. He said he was the best player that he played against. And, you know, when you watch Zidane, he, for me, I just like players that look, make things look effortless. Mm. And that's in all sports. Mm. You know, I, I think about tennis. I, I, I gravitate to Federer mm. because, he, because of his technique, because he makes things look Smooth. gracious. Even though Nadal is like, a fan, like one of the best ever, I look at him and he's about power to me. Even though he's got great technique as well, I look at him and look, think about power. I look at Federer, I think technique. Um, I look at Jordan, I say technique and mental toughness. I look at LeBron James and say, he's powerful, he's bigger, he's stronger. Um, you know, so for me, I always gravitate to the technique part of sport more than the power and, and training because I think everyone can kind of train and then get themselves to a certain level if they have that dedication. Mm. But someone like Messi and Jordan, that's God given. Yeah. That just happens. That's just there. You can't train that. Yeah. Like all these athletes you just mentioned, but I'm going to bring it back to football. You know, you've got really good footballers, respectfully yourself, yeah. and there's a list of others. And then you've got the Messi's, and then you've got the Ronaldo's, and then you might have, I don't know, Neymar's, etc. Yeah. These people are not just good at football, but they're also like these magnets for businesses. Like they are yeah. PR. They're a brand now, aren't they? They're a massive, massive yeah. brand. And going back to this following that Ronaldo's got a 460 million, do you think that is by chance or coincidence or is that all engineered to get him to that place? I mean, I think some of them followers might be bought. Okay. <laughs> no, but I think that, yeah, it's definitely engineered to make the most of himself. Ronaldo is a brand now, CR7, it's a brand, right? And it's like the, the, the more well-known you get and the richer you get, you know, you, you don't even have to pay for things no more. They come for free. Um, because you're that, you know, it's, it's free market. And if Ronaldo goes out there with a watch on, all of a sudden people think, oh, I want to go and buy that watch or clothes. I want to go and buy those clothes. Um, so people like that, like Ronaldo, Messi, Mayweather, like people will gravitate to them because they're such a brand. So for these brands, it's just free marketing. If you give someone a watch that's worth, you know, a million pound and that person's got 400 million followers, you know, I mean, it's easy, really. It's not. It's a drop in the ocean for the brand. Mm. You know, Ronaldo's going to get a watch that's worth a million pound, but obviously they're going to get free marketing from it. So, I mean, it, it's just part of the the, the the era of football that we live in now. Yeah. So this is a perfect segue to, to this question, which is, you know, you retired only a year ago. Uh, you're 40 years of age, am I right? Yeah. What's the, what's, the, what's, the, what's the key of looking and staying so young, mate? <laughs> Oh no, it's funny because I don't know. It's just good genes, I guess, and as well, the like Jay Boffroy, yeah, even, it's cream. Yeah, you've been exactly. using. yeah, I just and you know what the thing is, like when I watch all these, I mean, my wife always says to me, it's like strange that you got like, you know, I've been blessed that I've, you know, I don't have all the lines on my face and everything, but like. I mean, I only use, I wash my face with water. I don't even use all these facial washes and everything. I don't spend money on that. So for me, it's funny. I, think, I mean, it's just gets good genes, really. So I have to, you know, thank my parents for that. Yeah, look and looking after yourself, <laughs> etc. So, going from the conversation we just had to now, how have you seen the game change? Like, you know, physically on the pitch, but just everything around it. You know, the the the, the drama, the theatre, the politics, even the social media aspect of it. Yeah, well, I mean, I always when you, when you speak to players, when I speak to players now that are retired as well, especially that played in my era, and I've spoken to a lot of them. Like I've bumped into people, like, you know, even people like Omri. I've spoke, I bumped, I worked with Kevin Campbell recently, and I've obviously gone to Sky Sports and working on there. You you do bump into a, a lot of players that you've played with and against, and I always say the, the the funny thing is when when I was coming up you had to go and really earn your contracts. You had to go and really earn your money by playing well every single week mm. over the course of a season or a few seasons. Now players will get paid because they could potentially be good. Mm. And I think that's where it's different now. You had to really go and earn it, earn your P's. Now it's like, you could potentially be good, so we'll give you big money, and then you know maybe we might go and sell you, and then recoup it back. And I think that's a big part of the game now. And when you're giving these kind of people big money as soon as they leave school on their first professional contract, 
for them, I think financially it's great for their family, for themselves. Um, if they've got someone looking after it, if they've got someone guiding them in the right way. Um, for me, I wasn't that person. You know, as soon as I got my money, I was just like, I want to go shopping. Um, but I think also that can maybe take a bit of the hunger away from your actual game. Because mm. people, you know, and I'm not saying everyone, but some people out there might just think, you know what, I've got paid, man. I've made it now. This is it. And then take their eye off the ball. And I think when I look at football now, and like, I, I admire people like, you know, Kevin De Bruyne. You know, he's he's on, I don't know, probably the better part of 350, 400 grand a week. But the way he plays, he plays like he's trying to earn his first contract. He's always working really hard. You never see him going through the motions. And to me, that's a top professional. And then you see other players that are like much younger than him off earning, you know, same kind of money. And they look like they're going through the motions. Um, and then you question why? And then obviously you, you you say to yourself, you know, has he has he got some issues, you know, and everyone can like we've just spoken about, or have they lost that hunger? So I think it goes hand in hand. I think if you get you get money too soon, you can lose that hunger. But then obviously there's some special kind of players that just okay, I want to keep going. Um, and I think that's a big way the the game has changed in from my from when I was coming up to to now. Yeah. I definitely uh, resonate with that because uh, Kieran Richardson's been on my podcast, obviously playing for Man United, yeah. England, et, et cetera. And I kind of asked him the same sort of question. And he said, thankfully, his dad was there to kind of mentor him. And he said, the moment he signed for Man United, his dad went, great news, but consider this your last uh, season. And he went, well, what, what do you mean? I've just started. He said, no, you've got to treat every single season like your last yeah. because it could be. You could get injured, you could get dropped, etc. So the money you get, you need to invest. And mm. he thankfully did into buildings and now he's got a watch company, mm. uh, you know, sells watches and stuff. But other people, as you said, you the media's got a really good job of highlighting the people that are a bit loose with their money. You know, mm. they won't report on Kieran Richardson investing money into builders because that's boring for them. But they will report on somebody who's just bought a bright yellow Lamborghini and mm. someone that's just spent 50 grand in a club on, on, <coughs> on Cristal or Ace yeah. of Spades because uh, that's what s sells, right? So I think having the mentors is got to be super important as soon as you get, get that money because... Like you say, you could you can lose the, the slight hunger. On that note, if I can ask you a bit of a personal question, mm -hmm. what is the most reckless thing you have <laughs> bought with your money as a footballer? I mean, <laughs> reckless. I mean, watches. But I mean, like you said, they're, you know, you, you keep those and, you know, their investments, are obviously they, they go up in money. But I mean, wasteful. Like, I mean, we used to go to clubs when you was younger. I, I'm, I'm not a big drinker, but, you know, you used to go out like I don't know every weekend spend a few grand a week just on alcohol that I wasn't even drinking and then you look back at it and you say what was I doing you know what was I thinking um cars you know I used to spend a lot of money on cars because it's all a perception you know and you you don't think it's going to end I remember like, like when I first got sold to Coventry there was a player there called Richard Shaw and he was at the back end of his career and I remember him saying to me before you know it you're going to be at the back end of your career. So, you know, invest now. But when you're young, it's like, yeah, whatever. What's he talking about? But in hindsight, you listen to the experienced players and, you know, they're, they're always right because they've experienced that themselves. Um, I think myself, my parents done a fantastic job with me. Um, my mum was a cleaner. My dad worked for British Telecom. Um, they, they they took me to games, they done their absolute best and I love them for that and I appreciate them for that. Um, but at the end of the day, like you said, Kieran had his dad behind him and I believe his dad was into properties as well, I think. Um, and Kieran's done fantastically well. I know Kieran personally as well, we've got mutual friends um, and he's done really, really well. Um, but like you said, he had that advice from a very young age. Again, and someone, Stephen Sidwell, again, you know, his dad, I mean, his dad said to me, like, uh, you need to save half your money. And I'm thinking, what's this guy talking about? Like, I'm only 47 pound a week. How can I save my money? It's like half of it. 
like I can't live on that <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> but then you look back and I think the point he was trying to make was you know if you the more you, you the more you make try and save the um, the majority of it but again you know you, you you live and you learn um I was one of those players as well that I left home at a young age as well so you know I'm living up in 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 Coventry with no one guiding me really and you know agents i mean they 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 all promise the world and a small amount of them actually deliver as in you know we want to guide your career we can help you with this we can help you with that but then as your career goes on you realize that most of them just turn up at contract time or if a club's interested in you or if the club want to sell you or something along them lines so i think guidance um is really important when you become a footballer and good advice as in investment saving your money because a footballer's career you know it's like what it could be 15 years it could be 5 years you don't know what's going to happen you might get an injury and that's it and then you have to reinvent yourself and i think when i've spoken to a lot of players um that have had to retire early through injury or because they just couldn't get a club or they've had an injury and when they got back they wasn't the same um it's hard for them because they've had to give something up that they absolutely love doing and they didn't plan for life after football because they didn't there wasn't they didn't feel like they was going to retire at such a young age um but you know i i always think now when i look back at it, i speak to like even recently when i was in japan i was speaking to young players and you know now when i speak to young players as well i always say that you know get your shit in order save um think about life after football because you know you finish I was lucky I finished at 40 but you know you still got 40 years left of your life you know so you have to make sure if you don't want to change your lifestyle too much you've got to invest a lot to to have a comfortable life still but again it's just like meeting those people that can can really help you those good people and there's there's not a lot of them in football there's a lot of snakes out there there's a lot of people who says invest in this invest in that i remember a lot of people were saying invest in movies and it's a good for tax and you can write it off and all this kind of stuff and then all of a sudden you, you know you're getting in trouble with a tax man and you know it's just all this drama so there's a there's very few really good trustworthy people out there in football because everyone's just trying to make money for themselves Mm. The um yeah listen I've had so many conversations with lots of Anton Ferdinand Kim Richardson there's there's a bunch of different footballers and I've had very very similar conversations mm. to to this try and put myself in a footballer's shoes which is a little bit difficult because I can't I can't sort of um understand what it's like to be a, an athlete on that pitch but from making money perspective I can kind of understand it and when you're being told as a young man in your 20s you must feel at that point like the world is at your feet you know you've got nice cars you're young you're fit you're you're a high profile females are throwing themselves at yeah you're in a club you know you're basically adored and people That's the thing you feel like you, you, you feel, feel like, like this Superman. is it yeah this is it I've made it this yeah. is it and you feel like that but for me I've all, I've all, for me I'm like I'm a real product of my environment yeah you know f- you know I used to I used to be around some real guys that you just don't muck around with and for me when i made it i it wasn't me that just made it when i made it it was my friends that made it too so for me i used to go, you know go out on nights out take them all out you know you you ain't paying for nothing go on holiday pick up bills dinners like all that kind of stuff because these are the guys that i grew up with i love these guys um and today like i'm still friends with like pretty much all of them um and i mean even my best friend you know cheeks we grew up together and he he's gone off in on his way and he's and he's he's living in dubai now um I kind of cheeks. what you was yeah i know cheeks yeah exactly yeah, yeah, so yeah. he's like my best friend yeah yeah um and and he's done fantastic but we it was me and him together all the time we that's was how i met uh, kieran. kieran and also anton etc yeah so like we was we grew up in the same area on the same estate playing in the same cage you know we done everything together everything when i when i moved up into birmingham i bought a place in the mailbox and you know i remember he he went to he went to uni up in birmingham as well and we went to his dorms and i was like cheeks man 
you're not you're not living there, bruv. Like, and I, and he, he ended up living with me, and we we were staying together. But I'm I'm so proud of him because he's gone on and done really great things. He's really successful. Um, but it, it could have it could have easily gone the other way for us mm. because we was around like people that were doing just madness from a young age, like you know, stabbing people, robbing people. Um, you know, gang fights, you know, all, all that kind of madness. And I think the thing for us at that age, we was both engrossed in wanting to be a footballer, you know, and that was the thing that we both loved. Um, and for me, obviously I was fortunate that I, I became a footballer, but I think that he see that I was successful and he wanted that same success and he went and done it in, in another way. So I'm I'm really proud of him and, and he knows that. Yeah. So like being being that young young guy, I'm not just saying to you, but I'm just saying to a lot of footballers, especially alpha male type, you know, like, you know, we all have an ego when we think, think we're doing really well at something, whether it's in business, whether it's boxing, football, yeah. whatever, you, you develop this ego. And part of the ego is actually really good because it actually makes you more successful. But sometimes it can actually shield you away from good advice. And I know fully well, if someone said to me, I'll save half your money every single week, that language doesn't make any sense to me <laughs> because because it's like what are, you, what are you talking about that's almost like going into retreat mentality but i think if you change the language and say if you if you store half of your money you could actually go from being rich which you are to becoming wealthy and yeah. let me show you how to do that if you yeah. buy assets and start compounding the assets do you know jay-z do you know p diddy do you know yeah. all these elite people do you know why they're not rappers anymore and they're business people because they're wealthy because what they've done as a rapper he started storing their wealth and, and investing into it. And they transformed, they transformed yeah. themselves, they reinvented themselves. They, you know, it, they got themselves to that point by rap, hip hop, and um, being a musician. But when you get to that point, you know, you don't want to rap forever. Now they're investments. But the thing is, I, th I think one good thing about foot being a footballer is you get to meet people that you wouldn't normally be able to meet. You know, so if you said, you know, you're, you're gonna meet, you know, I've had, I've had dinners with like, people that you just think, wow, how am I on the same table as this coming from Archway Estate? And now I'm sitting down with, you know, I'm sitting next to people like Monica Lewinsky and, you know, even even Boris Johnson before he kept, became prime minister. And, and these people, um, Rolling Stones, you know, and it's like, how, how am I meeting these people? But you meet because of the platform you're on, mm. you're a footballer. And even if you're not, you know, at the top of your, you know, your game, like at Man United or Arsenal or somewhere like that, Chelsea, you still get to meet these people because you're a footballer ultimately. Um, and the same with musicians, you know, who's like P Diddy's, you know, he, he came from a rough background in, in New York and Jay-Z did. And it's like, now they're like business people. They're running, you know, they've got, a brand, but their own stuff. They, they've just completely turned their life around. And like you said, they're business people now. Yeah. Um, just cause I'm in, intrigued and I like the hustle from like an, an estate to becoming a higher profile footballer and doing really, really well. And I, I, I there's, there's a lot of stuff that I can relate to as well. Cause when I started making money when I was in my twenties, Cheeks knows me very well. And we come from quite a similar sort yeah. of like hustle background. Um, started spending money on the Lambos, Porsches, Ferraris. What sort of cars have you owned? And uh, <laughs> which one's been your favorite? Yeah, I had uh, Lambo. I mean, Lambo I had to send back after a few weeks because I couldn't fit in it. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, and what, I was getting was back it? problems. Um, what was it again? Uh, Gallardo. It? Yeah, Gallardo, yeah, yeah, Gallardo, That's yeah. What I had. That was it, the yeah, black one, yeah. And it was like, I'm, obviously I'm tall and compared to a Ferrari, it's quite narrow, right? And it's like, I couldn't, I was like sitting upright and you know, I had it for about three or four weeks in the summer and then I was like, this ain't, this ain't working for me. It's really uncomfortable. You could feel all the bumps in the road and it was just like, nah, got rid of that. Um, yeah, I've had a Ferrari. The cars that I actually enjoyed the most was actually Bentleys. I thought they were really, yeah. really nice. And I was so wasteful with money back in the day and I just do some silly things because it's coming every week. You know, you look at your contract and you sign a four year deal. It's like, oh, you know, I can do it this time because, you know, you pay monthly for a car as well. Like young people think that people go and pay cash for a car. It's not, they just pay monthly payments for it. You put a deposit down, you pay like, I don't know, a grand, a grand a month, two grand a month, you got a Ferrari. That's it. That's it, you don't actually own it, but the perception is you must be wealthy and rich because you can drive a Ferrari. Um, and that's just, you know, that's just rubbish. Um, but yeah, I remember when you talk about wasteful, I remember I had like a, 
a black Bentley and a white Bentley at the same time, <laughs> just because I didn't want to, I didn't like going to the petrol station. So I used to fill up one tank and then drive that one and you know, the other ones there. So I, I used to stay at the petrol station longer. So just stupid things like that, where I just think like, well, again, like wasteful, what are you doing? But it's a perception where I grew up, you kind of wanted to show what you had as well. Mm. When I look back at it now, I mean, even now, like, you know, I still get nice things and I, and I keep nice things, but I don't show it now. I'm just like, all the people I know that are really, really wealthy, you would, they just don't look it at all. Mm. You know, some of them just look homeless even. Mm. Like they just wear baggy trousers, slippers out, you know. And it's like, it's almost like, well, they're, they've got generational wealth. Why do they need to show it for? Mm. Um, and, and I think that's the important thing. You can be rich, but rich only lasts for a short period. Mm. Generational wealth is like your kids, your kids' kids. And I think that's what it's all about. I think when you when you reach that, the pinnacle, you, you have to start thinking about your family and your, your, you know, your generational family to come. Yeah, well, look, uh, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, uh, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, just to name a few billionaires in the world, these are the elite. These are worth, you know, if not hundreds, you know, some of them are worth $100 billion, which is an insane amount of money. It seems like a lot of us pursue getting money and then getting that money to grow. But then when you get to a certain level, they spend a lot of time giving it away. Mm. like finding ways and it sort of goes full cycle you know as you're growing up you want the Ferraris you want the nice watches you want the nice house and stuff and then you do it for a while and then you sort of go back it's almost like living basic again mm. and I think you need to go through that through that cycle 100% and I think do you know what I think as well I was going to say this earlier but I forgot I think kids at school should learn how to manage their finances you know there's a lot of subjects at school where you, it, you actually don't go into life using them mm most people probably wouldn't. Um, but it, everyone needs to know how to manage money. So why don't they educate you at school how to do that? Um, and even in football clubs, you know, they're academies now, they should give you insight of how to manage your money. Clubs will give you the money, but most clubs won't tell you how to use it, invest it and what to do with it. Definitely. And I think that's important um, going forward because there's some people out there like for, like I said for me like as soon as I got money I was just interested in spending it I want nice things I'm young I can do this I can do that because you know I'm going to get another next contract I'm going to get another sign on fee but then I was actually speaking to a, a footballer recently who, who, who played lower leagues and he said he was thinking about um, his life after football while he was actually playing because he knew that he wasn't going to earn enough money to have options at the end of his career, like, and he wasn't one of these people that could, um, has a big enough profile where they can use it to go, or maybe go on television or maybe do something in some other sector. So he was thinking about life after Paul, and actually he's done really well and he's made more money after the game than during the game, but he was doing playing the game because of a, a passion. A lot of footballers, you know, won't do that. Yeah. Um, I didn't, to be honest, I didn't start thinking about investments and all these kind of things till I was like mid to late twenties. Yeah. Cause I just thought it's always going to last But then the closer you get to 30, you think shit, you know, I could only have a few years left now. I need to start, you know, wising up and, and save as much as you can. Can I ask like the top of your career, yeah. how much was you on a week? <laughs> <laughs> I was on like, I'll I'd, I'd just say 30 plus. Um, you mentioned earlier 47. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, no, I, I, earned, I earned good money. Um, and that was when I started back buying properties and, you know, I got with my wife and she was uh, guiding me in the right way. And then I started meeting people that helped me in the right way as well. You know, I still like, you know, everyone still you, you still indulge sometimes and then you look back at it and say I shouldn't have done that mm. you know you wake up in the morning you see your receipt and you're like fuck but then you know I think my late 20s and it definitely in my 30s I started like being more shrewd with my money and and uh, thinking about you know where you want your kids to be because mm. when you when you're, you're when you're young and you're in your 20s right it's all about you Mm. You have like a tunnel vision. I want to be the best footballer in the world. I don't care about anything else. I want to play well. I want to earn money and I want to enjoy it. But then you get into your 30s and it's almost like, okay, 
I've got a kid, man. I want I don't want him to have the same hardship I did when I was coming up. So I want to give him the best possible opportunities. Um, so for me, as I got into my late twenties, that's when I that's when the, like the penny dropped, and I was like, okay. So I was fortunate that I was in a position where I was still earning really good money, but um, I had good advice as well, and I started saving at the right time. So as much as I wasted, I still had time to make more. Yeah. The last part of this this conversation about money, I, I just want to know what the feeling was like being again from a council estate, humble beginnings, you know, um, and you know you were around certain characters were a little bit edgy back mm. back then. Um, I've actually got a quote here that I, I picked up from a publication and said that I was around troublemakers, people that were serving fifteen years in prison. So mm. you've gone from that kind of culture mm. to like right up here. Mm. What was that like when you first signed the? Your, your first big contract and you start receiving, I don't know, what was it, like four For, grand a week, five grand a no, week? No, no chance. Back then it was like, back then the first contract, I think the first contract I signed was like 1,500 quid a week. Yeah, how was that feeling? It, again, it, it, it would feel like about 100 grand a week because you've gone from like, now I went from YTS, right, at the time, it was like 47 pounds a week. And then I went to earning 1,500 pounds a week. And it was like, sh like this is amazing. Like I can go and buy things and do things. I, I never came down to the West End until I started earning that kind of money. I was going to buy clothes in like Wood Green and Holloway Road and, and places like that. Um, and now I'm like earning this much money. I'm like, you know, I, I used to look, look at, um, I, I, was, I was with him the other day actually, Les Ferdinand, and he always presented himself really nice. Um, and he always dressed really well. He always had a, like a nice, you never see him with a, you know, without a, a nice shape up in his hair and everything. And the first time I actually came down to do shopping here, I bumped into him in the Versace shop and I was like, geez, that, that's one of my idols. Um, and I was telling that the other day and he was laughing, but yeah, I mean, as, as well, straight away, as soon as you earn money, this is just me, like you, you feel like you want to go back to your era and kind of show everyone you've earned that money now. You might buy a diamond necklace, diamond earrings, nice car, like you said, and you go back and you want to kind of show them people. And then there's people there that are like with you, like supporting you, like, well done, Jay, like, I'm so proud of you. And then there's other people, the jealous people that are just like, okay, I want to try and take advantage of this situation. Um, but again, I was fortunate that the people that I went with, I went to Holloway Boys, a lot of them people like, I mean, even today, I still speak to, we still meet up and I always went back to my area because I truly believe if you don't know where you're from, you don't know where you're going to end up going. Um, so for me, I always appreciate, I always go back to my area, I always like speak to kids in and around that community because I can relate to them. And I, and I say that sometimes, you know, these kids from like Archway, Hornsey, Finsbury Park, Tottenham that I bump into and I speak to, I can relate to them because I was them one time and not a lot of people can do that. So for me, I, it was always about um, making it. And then once I earned that money, of course you're gonna make mistakes and the feeling is like, you know, you, now you're going to a nightclub and you know, you're playing for like England under 50, 16, 17s, 18s, you're earning good money, you're dressing nice now. And like you said, everything comes with that nightclubbing, women, you know, and. I mean, sometimes you can take the ball, your eye off the ball. I was one of those people. I took my eye off the ball, but you know, like I said, I was fortunate that in the moments where I took my eye off the ball, I was able to turn it around. When I, I, I you know, it's like you're coming to the end of your contract. Someone might say to you, you know, you've only got a year left. Your agent's trying to negotiate a, a new deal for you, and it's like we'll see what it's doing at the end of the season. So then it kind of kicks you back into gear, and you're like fully focused on the football again. Um, I, but again, that, that was just me. I can only speak about my ups and downs and my pitfalls. Um, I wish I had done things differently. I wish I knew, you know, then what I know now, being more consistent. Um, but I mean, it's a part of growing up, right? Definitely, definitely. Gonna read this out to you, right? The Star, it's not probably the best paper, but they always have very, very funny, controversial headlines. On the 7th of May, 2022, ex-England international Jay Buffroyd was headbutted during a row over clothes peg. Um, it goes on to say about <laughs> David Noble apparently headbutted you. And I, I, I've never seen this until I started doing a bit more research yeah. into you. 
Can you tell me a bit more about that incident? He's, do you know what the funny thing is? I, he's one of my best pals. And I mean, even to this day, our, our, our group of players, we always meet up at Christmas and go for a few beers and whatnot. And just, it's, it, honestly, it just feels like we, we come back together. It's like we've been with each other, you know, just last week. And we all get on, we always have a laugh. Um, but that particular day, I remember, we was play, I think we was playing Fulham away or someone like that. And I remember going in the change room. It, it, do you know what? He sees it the complete opposite to the way I see it. We've actually laughed about this. The way I saw it was, I put my jacket on the peg and we went out to see the pitch as you do to see what boots you're going to wear, studs or molds. And then I came back in and my, my clothes were just dashed in the corner. And I, so I looked at it and I was like, Who's, whose jacket's this? And those was like, it's mine. So now we're like, we're, I was like, you're going to move it then? And then he was like, no, that's my peg. So now we're like kind of coming close to each other. And I'm like, for me, I'm always a firm believer, like, you know, don't come into my airspace because, you know, I'm not waiting to get here. I'm going to, I'm going to hit you first and then ask questions later. And obviously he thinks the same thing. So in this particular moment, he just headbutted me. And like, I was like, that, in my mind, I was like, that doesn't feel right. So then I, I swung a punch and then like I punched like around like about two or three people hit him in the ear. <laughs> and I remember he said that like, I couldn't hear for like a few weeks, but then we went out and we played them and uh, we, we, we beat them. I think I scored and we won like three nil. And I remember the manager went into uh, Nobes afterwards and was like, you should do that every week to him. <laughs> like that. And we, we always laugh about it to this day, but it was like, there was always arguments like that in my group. It's like, it was just happening like every day there was an argument or some kind of dispute. Um, but I said, I, I'll be honest with you, I think that's what spurred us all on. That's why we, my group was one of the success, most successful youth teams ever because we was, we was all competing. I remember Neil Banfield, who was our coach and, and Don Howe, but especially Neil Banford, I remember like we was all there having like some kind of team meet and there must've been about 30 players there. Mm. And I remember him saying, if two of you make, if one of you make it, we'll be happy. If two of you make it, it will be like, great. We're just happy with that. So like, I remember like looking around thinking, like, yeah, like if two of us make it, there's like 30, 40 players there. And in that moment I was like, well, I'm going to be that, I'm going to be one of those. And I guess like people like Nobes, Graham Stack, John Halls, like Pennant, Jerome, like Stephen Sidwell, they was all thinking something similar. And when we went out on the pitch, it was just like, we, I mean, I remember losing one game, Steve, honestly. I remember losing one game. I think it was against Bristol, Bristol Rovers. We went away and the pitch was like that on a hill. Um, it was pouring the rain. It was windy. And they had loads of like big, strong, fast players. And we just couldn't cope with it. And we lost 5-0 that day. And um, I remember the Don Howe and, and Neil Banfield called us in and said like, you're come to Highbury tomorrow morning. This is like a Sunday now. And um, we got there and he said, you're, you're running up every flight of stairs at Highbury. And then after that, we didn't, we didn't lose again. That was it. We just like would turn up, beat teams, professional. And that, that was like the life at Arsenal where we was just always competing with each other, like five asides in, in the training, we just wanted to win all the time. And it was like the bragging rights after training, we like be hammering each other. But it was, I, I don't think that I could have had the football education and that kind of, the, the kind of support that Arsenal gave me and made me into, um, I, no other club was offering that because it was just the best in the country at the time. Yeah. Why did you go in 2014 to Asia then? Like, and, and, and Thailand, Japan. Like, I, I hear people playing in China and I hear people playing in like, I mean, me was speaking to Anton before he retired. He said he was, he was you know, nearly thinking about going over to India. Um, I asked, I said to Anton, come over to Japan. And he was like, if and button. And then, you know, he didn't end up coming and he ended up playing, I was, I think, was it for Wickham or someone like that? Yeah. Yeah. Or South End, South End. Um, That's and, it, South uh, yeah, South yeah. End, and, and then that's a decision he made. But I said that you know, because it's it's a, it's a really good standard. I mean, you look at the players that are there even now, like Iniesta's there, Sampa, Vermaelen, um, Forlan was there, Podolski was there. Like it's a it, it's, and you see the Japanese players that's coming to England now on and Europe, and it's like yeah, 
you know, the, they've got really good players and it's a really good standard. It's very professional. Stadiums are big. Most of them are World Cup stadiums. Um, very safe, clean, like respectful country. Lovely, lovely place. Um, but when, when I left QPR, it was more like, I've always been one of those people that I, I, I wasn't, I didn't mind stepping out of my comfort zone. Um, and that, I mean, even then, when I went to Italy, I went to Italy when I was 21. And even then it was like, it's not something that everybody does. Even now, like not many English players will go and play abroad. Mm. It's happening more and more, um, but it didn't happen back then that much. So for me, it was kind of like, okay, I'm in my thirties. I got offered a good contract. And they said, go out there. And, and I was like, I went out there. I was like, okay, I'll give it a go. You know, why not? I'm going to earn like good money more than I would get in the championship. And um, and then there was security as well for a few years. So I was thinking that's important, especially in my thirties. Um, I have security is important. Now, money's important, but so security is not just like, you know, uh, give me one year and then you're at the end of the year, you're like, oh, where do I go now? Mm. So they, they gave me a few years, but then I was there and I, in Thailand and I was just like, as much as it's a really nice place and I met some really nice people, the standard just wasn't good enough. And it, it the, 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 football standard. the football standard wasn't good enough and, the, and, and it was unorganized at the time. Um, it didn't give me that challenge that I want. Like I always want to feel like I'm, challenged I'm playing against good players because I think when you when you have a challenge that's when you really find out about yourself who you are um so after I think it was after about six months I was like listen guys you know just can can we tear up my contract and you know I want I want to move on from here because I'm not feeling satisfied I, I don't feel like I want to be here I feel like I need to play at a high level and to be fair they did that and then I bumped into a, a agent actually while I was in Thailand and he said, would you come and play in Japan? So now I'm thinking in my mind, okay, I've gone to Thailand and made a mistake. Like, what should I do now? So I says to him, okay, like I'll come to Japan. Cause I've never been there before. I'll come to Japan for a few weeks um, at the end of the season. Cause in Asia, it's a calendar season. Season starts in February, finishes like right, the beginning of December, yeah. So like, I was like, I'll come at the end of the season. So I, we went there, like it, it must've been like that. The last few weeks of November, me and my wife, just to see like, could we live here? Then I went to see a few games. What's the standard like? What's the, the stadiums like? What's the training pitches like? Uh, and then obviously I was talking to a few clubs at the time. And then I just decided, you know what? I can come here. I can come and play here. It's good quality. There's players here. Um, the first one I bumped into was Diego Forlan, who, who was at uh, Man United and, play, and played uh, really well in Spain as well. So for me, I was like, yeah, I can come and do this. And then it, it turned out being the best decision. I One of the best decisions I ever made um, going to, to Japan at the end of my career. Okay. What's been, would you say, the best moment in your career? I mean, the best moment in my career was obviously playing for playing for England, um, and it, it it was it was nice as well because I was at Cardiff at the time, and it was the best that that them three years I had at Cardiff was probably the most enjoyable, best time I had in football. Um, the lads were really good. We used to go out for meals with the wives as well. We used to go and have nights out with just the boys. Living in Cardiff when you're winning games and you're competing for the, in the playoffs, I mean, there, there's not many better cities than, than Cardiff. And then the, the the derby game was amazing against Swansea. It's like the the atmosphere was electric. We had good players come to the club as well. I think in in my second and third year, like Michael Chopper came back, and at the time he was playing really well. Pete and Whittingham, Bellamy came, Aaron Ramsey came. Um, Jason Kumas at the time came. A lot of really good players came. So I was really enjoying my football. Um, and then I got called up by England, but it was kind of, it was weird because I remember I played a game, I forgot it was against. And I remember Dave Jones, who was the manager at the time, he just, I, at the time I just remember thinking, oh, he's just, you know, he, sometimes he just said things that you just think, ah, oh, he's just, you know, he's giving you a compliment, but he doesn't really mean it. 
And he said that he's got the quality to play for England. And then all of a sudden, that story just kind of started growing. Like every game I was playing and I was scoring and I was playing really well, it was just like adding to it, adding to it, adding to it. And then he, there was one game he came in the dressing room and says to me, um, there's a representative coming to watch you from the England setup. And I was like, you winded me up, ain't you? And he's like, no, seriously. And like, shut up. And he's like, Jay, there's someone upstairs from the England camp come to watch you today. So in my mind, I'm thinking, now there's pressure on me. Like, well, I was just enjoying my football and thinking about playing well. Now I'm thinking, if there's someone up there from the England FA, I've got to play well now because I want to be in that squad ultimately. And um, I remember I played well and I scored. And then again, it was like a few games now, they're coming to watch me. And I kept doing well and I kept scoring. And then the the squad got announced, the preliminary squad, and there's I think there's like about 30 players in the preliminary squad or something like that. And then it gets like narrowed down. And at the time I was just buzzing to be in a preliminary squad. You know, like you get that recognition from the championship as well. Like the recognition that your people are thinking about putting you in the like England squad. And at the time, you know, you're playing with some of the best players in the world as well. So I was like, man, this is like, this is like surreal. But then in my mind as well, because I had some, you know, I had some ups and downs at Wolves previously. Well, I started off really well at Wolves and I loved the Wolves fans were passionate. The the stadium was great. And then I fell out with Mick McCarthy and, you know, he was treating me a certain way, which was like unacceptable in my eyes. But then, it, I mean, it's kind of like that. I don't want to say it's kind of like that Ronaldo situation, but what he said, I actually agree with when he said, if the manager don't respect me, why do I respect him? Right. And that's what I felt at the time, because first and foremost, I might be young. Right. Mm -hmm. And I might be a footballer, but I'm a man just like you. You have to respect me as a man. Forget football. You, there has to be some respect as a person. Mm -hmm. Right. And I didn't feel that from him. So he never got that back from me. And then we just like end up butting heads and, and and then I wasn't training with the first team. I lost my squad number, all these kinds of things. And then three years later, like we're talking about cycle, I'm playing for England. So that obviously just says to him, you, you know, you're an idiot, you was wrong. Um, but you didn't give me the same support that Dave Jones gave me. He got the best out of me. You could have been that guy that got the best out of me. And I think that's what good managers do. They find a way of getting the best out of those players. Dave Jones did that for me. He gave me the platform. And I remember he said, when I first went down there, he said to me, listen, I'm going to give you the stage. You have to go and make it happen. So I, re I remember going home that actually to the hotel, not home. I went to the hotel and I just said, starting from tomorrow, I want to make myself indispensable every day. I want to make myself indispensable every match. And then, like I said, it happened. And then I got called out for England and it was like the, the, the best moment of like my life. Cause you know, at, at Wembley against France as well, North London and all my friends are there from my area. Like my mum and dad's there. Like it was just emotional. And I didn't, even though I didn't start the game, you know, standing there singing a the national anthem, looking behind you and you can see your family there. It's just like, the best ever feelings. It's kind of funny when people say one cut wonder. It's like, I always think to myself, you know, how many, first of all, how many people actually make it as footballers, like 0, 0. something percent of people that actually start, actually make it as footballers, but then to play for your country, <laughs> I mean, it's just like the best feeling in the world. On the flip side, worst moment of your career? I look at, I, I, I honestly do look at, football like a lessons and you know where there's negatives there'll be positives um but of course looking back now if i hadn't have thrown my shirt i say thrown because you know a throw is like you know overhand right i kind of took my shot off and just went like that and dropped it, it and it, you know i hit don Howe and i end up leaving under those circumstances but that's probably my biggest regret because i mean i would have loved to play for arsenal week in week out and you know, in being from North London as well, like that kind of, that kind of thing. And I remember Wenger was talking about it as well, like bringing me through. He actually pulled me before the end of the season. He said, listen, I'm thinking about bringing you through and playing you in the cup game, the cup games next season and, you know, being around it. Because at the time I was training with the first team every day anyway. Um, 
And back to what you were saying, actually, when I got called out for England, we was training at Arsenal's training ground. So I got to go back there as an England player now. So even there probably would have been people there because there were some people there that was, were there when I left. Um, so to go back there now as an England player, it was kind of like, I, I proved you wrong. Mm. You know, not a lot of people get released from somewhere and then go back, you know, with their country, let alone with another club. Um, and Wenger um, took me in his office and, you know, had a chat with me and he, he, he said some really good things to me, like, and it just made me feel like, man, like it, he gave me some real compliments and he put him in the newspaper as well. Like Jay, you know, he said like, Jay's like one of the most talented players I ever worked with. And to me, that meant so much to me considering like, the players he's worked with, like Henri's, Anelka's, Burkamp's, you know, Vieira Petit, all these kind of, Ashley Cole, like all these kind of like world-class players. And then he said that I'm one of the most talented players he's worked with. Um, in my mind, it was like such a big compliment to me, but then obviously on the flip side, I'm like, man, I wish my attitude had have been better when I was younger, because had it have been better, had I've handled things in a different way, had there been the support then that the players get now, things would have been different. Um, but it wasn't to be, and then, you know, I ended up leaving, I went to Coventry, I went to Italy, I met my wife. Um, so like I said, where there's negatives, there was positives as well. So, I mean, but to answer your question, that was probably my biggest regret. Um, best goal? To be festive, I scored some good ones, you know. I was, like, <laughs> I was looking like, people always send me goals and say like, you know, I think, I mean, I scored some really good ones in Japan. I scored one from the half, just over the halfway line. Uh, I scored a really nice volley as well in Japan. Um, but the goal I scored for Wolves against Leeds, I liked that goal a lot, purely for the fact that it was like, I think it was like the last kick of the game away against Leeds. Um, the Wolves fans were, you know, they created a great atmosphere. The Leeds fans, um, the stadium was great. It's always full at Leeds as well. And then I scored, like I got a shot from about, I don't know, 25 yards and it went like straight in the top corner, last kick of the game. Uh, that was that was probably uh, my favourite goal. But I, I, I was known for like scoring good goals. I, 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 it's funny because when I look at my game, I wasn't one of those forwards that I didn't get many of them ugly tap-ins. And I remember managers always used to say, you need to get them ugly tap-ins. Um, and I remember going back to Dave Jones, I, we, we always spoke like about my game because I was one of those people, I'm a morning person, so I get to train in early, have my breakfast, and he was one of those people that got there early. So we always used to talk as well. Um, and he says, you know, you spend a lot of time out the box, you drift into wide areas. And he said, I want you to stay more central. And I said, you know, I, I did grow up in a, a way at Arsenal where you was encouraged to like, float around, get on the ball, try and influence a game. And I, I said to Dave Jones, I said, how about this? You know, if you let me play my game, let me float around and try and influence a game, I promise you I'll get in the box to get them ugly goals and get them bits. And that season I did, and I think I scored 20 goals that year. Um, but again, yeah, I think that definitely Wolves was, I think my best goal, That the one that, you know when it's the last kick of the game as well? Mm. That that in itself is just like amazing. Like that kid the other day, Ganacho, uh, when he scored that goal, it was a it was a really good goal. But because it's the last kick of the game, it just makes it that extra bit special as well. Yeah, it's a bit like uh, boxing, last punch of the of the round. round and yeah, you're not, not the personnel, yeah. especially if you're in the back foot as well. Like exactly, you're being yeah. beaten up and then suddenly bang. Fight. That's it. Yeah, you to KO. <laughs> uh, best club that you've ever played for. I mean, I, I, I have to say Cardiff, just purely for the, again, you know, reverting back to what I said, they, they gave me the platform. They turned my, Dave Jones, Terry Burton, um, turned my career around. Again, they yeah. gave me the platform. Um, so I definitely have to say that period. Um, and that was where I played my best football, I would say. Okay. We got the World Cup coming up, yeah? Yeah. Uh, obviously being a former footballer, uh, you must take a bit of interest in it. Um, 
I have got here that you actually said that I'm a Chelsea supporter. <laughs> Raheem Sterling should not be starting for England uh, and going to the World Cup. No, no, I didn't say not going to the World okay, Cup. I said, I said that he, he shouldn't be starting. At the World Cup, yeah. Yeah, at the World Cup. Um, again, like, I have to give Raheem his flowers first. In my opinion, he's one of the best players that this country's produced. He's had a fantastic career. He's a great player still. I'm not, what, my comments is not um, to put him down or say that he's not good enough or anything like that. Um, QPI started, done well, moved to Liverpool, done fantastically well, went to City, amazing. He's put in great performances for England as well, especially in the previous competitions. But I just think right now, I, don't, I think the players that should start the first game in the World Cup are the players that are in form because I think it's important to get off to a winning start, a good start. Especially, and no disrespect to Iran, but if if England was to win that first game 1-0 in the 90th minute, you're saying, okay, it's a win, but we struggled. You don't grow confidence like that. I think if you win that first game 3-0, for example, all of a sudden there's a buzz in the dressing room you know, in a squad, in the country, fans, all of a sudden now, it's like you can grow on that now. So for me, it, it was nothing to do with how good he is because I think he's a great, great player. But I just think right now, he's not in form. He's the things that he was doing easily before, um, he's not doing right now. And I think that is confidence. I think it's a transitional state for Chelsea. I think you'd agree, new manager, I mean, Graham Potter, and um, he's still trying to find his formation, trying to find out where he wants players to play. And he, he done a similar kind of thing at Brighton, to be honest. He, it, it didn't happen overnight. Um, but because of that, I think Raheem Sterling particularly is finding it difficult because when he's played his best football, he's played in them wide areas, like in a 4-3-3 or 4 2 3 one or... Um, and that's where he got the best out of him, where he's making them run, them diagonal runs in behind. And when you've watched Chelsea play, they kind of play with like two number 10s, like Mount uh, and Havertz and then Havertz and then like Bamian up front or something like that. Um, and I don't think that suits him because um, I don't think he's one of those players that are going to, you know, get on the ball and turn. Do you know, like we were talking about when you, when you talk about like Kevin De Bruyne, like you get turned and like Fred balls through to the striker. He's not that kind of player in my opinion. He's he's a player that gets into the box. He runs onto things. When he receives the ball around the box, he's really sharp. And we're not seeing that from him at the moment. That's the only reason I said that he shouldn't be starting. Realistically and honestly, yeah. do you think Ken England win a World Cup? <sighs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'd love to see it. Obviously, I've never seen it in my lifetime. I'd love to see it, but I just, I, I don't think the squad overall is is good. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, and I was saying this earlier, I'll tell you what really bothers me is that England are ranked, I think they're the top, they're definitely ranked in the top five in the world countries for football. Um, but, I always keep hearing, oh, you know, we're going to have to, uh, you know, may maybe change things depending on who we play against. But when I've seen like the teams that win the World Cup, generally speaking, they'll like play their, play their formation and they might change personnel, but they don't change their whole formation based upon who they're playing. So for me, I always say that, you know, you play the players that are in form, you play the best formation for those players, and you try and go out there and win. You don't think about, oh, you know, who are we playing against? Oh, they got a dangerous player, so we'll change up the thing to five at the back or three, five, two. Just go and play what you think is the best formation. And we talk about the, the England team. I said this, I, I believe there's not enough players. I think more players are comfortable in playing a four, three, three or a four, two, three, one than a three, you know, a three, five, two or a five, three, two, for example. You, you know, you look at Luke Shaw, he plays a four at the back. Stones, he plays in a four at the back. Walker, when he's fit, he plays in a four at the back. Trippier, the same. Um, um, Declan Rice plays in, I think, four two three one. He as a defensive midfielder. Bellingham, I think he's at Dortmund in a four three three. Foden, four three three. 
Then you play with wingers, like you Saka plays in a three up front. It's like more players are used to playing in a four three three or four two three one than in a fourth, you know, in a four. I mean, a three five two or five three two, whatever you want to call it. So, in my opinion, I, I think that the formation should be what suits most of the players in the mm. squad, and I think that's the way they can be most successful. I um, mean, then you see, you look at Kane. Kane has the way he plays for Tottenham. How successful he is with Tottenham. Yeah, he got Golden Boot, but he doesn't look as dangerous for England as he does for Tottenham. And I think that's to do with the formation. Um, I know we've gone off off subject a little bit, but I don't think that England can win the World Cup. But I would expect them to get to like the semi-finals or something. And that's purely based upon the other nations. Argentina, I think I think Argentina will win it this year, and I hope they do because that that will solidify my argument about Messi. Um, but obviously Brazil are strong as well. France is strong, even though they lost Pogba and and uh, Conte. Um, Belgium as well, I think they they're strong. They got a lot of good good players. Um, but if if I had to bet on it, I would say Argentina. But I think it would be really disappointing if if England didn't at least get to the semi final. Yeah. So lo- last part of this uh, conversation, mate. So I know you retired. Mm. You're forty, and like you said, there's at least forty. There could be fifty, sixty, <laughs> seventy, maybe even a hundred years yeah. left of your life. Who knows? Hopefully. Like, what do you do now? Like, as a professional footballer, there's the obvious stuff, which is, you know, being a pundit, you know, mm. uh, going on radio, you know, going on Sky Sports, for example, mm. Talk Sport, etc. But you mentioned earlier about investing in property, investing into art and mm. stuff like that. Like, what are you up to as far as business investment and kind of purpose now in life? Yeah, like, um, obviously, properties, developing, um, interior design, art, um, I, obviously I love that being being. A, I mean to be honest I really like being a pundit I love football I love talking about it but I enjoy the research part of it as well actually it's funny it's weird that you know when you when you find when you get a game and it's like you, you know you get you get a stack pack and then you've got to do the research and I, I like that part of it um, but off the field yeah I was fortunate that I, I met some interesting people some successful people off the pitch Um so I like development. Um, like we said, I mean, I've just started collecting art. Um, I think I haven't, I think I've just got my fingers in a lot of pies at the moment where I'm just trying to find out exactly where I want to go, but I'm not being reckless about it. I've, I'm, I've got good people around me now. Um, I get good advice. Um, I'm not, you know, throwing money away. Um, I'm being shrewd about it, and I've made some. I've made some good investments, which thankfully, thankfully, paid off as well. So it's just more about over the course. I've only been retired like what eleven months now, um, and at the beginning, it's like you know you retire and it's like I'm just gonna chill out for a bit, and then you know you can only play like so much golf and and do kind of wake up when you want for so long before you get bored. Um, but I always had it in my mind that I would want to be a, a sports pundit, and I want to, you know, I want to, I want to move up the ladder, and hopefully one day, you know, reach where, where them, you know, the guys like you know Gary Neville, Cara, um, you know, Rio, people are, that are at. Um, but of course, I think it's important that you you do the correct things off the pitch as well, right? Mm. Um, like we spoke about investments. Um, Someone actually said to me the other day, you know, you'd be a good middleman. You know, a lot of middlemen make really good money now from putting um, companies together, people together, um, and they become really successful. Like, so even, you know, those kind of things, because I don't feel, I don't feel intimidate, intimidated to step into a room that, you know, speaks about politics, speaks about race, speaks about football, you know, all kinds of subjects. I don't know everything, but I know a little bit about everything. Mm. And if I know that I'm going to step into a room you know, I'm happy to go and read about things and learn about things before I go into a room and, you know, feel like I'm, you know, treading water. Mm. No, I really want to thank you for your time, mate. Uh, yeah. I know you've probably got a bunch of other things to do today, including spending time We didn't time talk with about boxing. Boxing, I mean, what do you want to know about boxing? <laughs> no, mate, I, it's funny because when I, when I was like, when I was young, my dad's an amateur boxing coach okay. at Islet and Boys Club. So 
I used to get in a bit of trouble when I was younger and like, you know, fight and all that kind of stuff. And as much as I love football, I used to get in arguments. So I, he, he started taking me to the boxing clubs. And at the time, you know, you get the, the Irish guys in there and, you know, they're tough. They don't muck around. And it's like, now I'm jumping in the ring with, um, you know, these Irish Irish travellers and, 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 and whatnot. And it's like, bloody hell, like, it's tough. But it got to the point when I was like nine years old, I'm just, you know, going through it quickly. But nine years old, when my dad said, like, what do you want to do? you want to play football or do you want to do boxing? Because now like QPR Crossroads, wanted yeah. to sign me and I was like, yeah, I, I, I love football, man. I want to do that. Because I remember like, you know, boxing, You, I mean, you know, boxing training is hard. You've got to do it by yourself. A lot of time you're spending by yourself. Um, and I think it's even more difficult to actually make it mm. as a boxer. Mm. And you can't play boxing. Mm. You know, the, the thing with boxing is anyone can turn over to be a pro like you could be called a pro yeah and to have that vanity metric like yeah i'm a pro athlete i'm a pro footballer but they, they are different because if you're a pro footballer you kind of have to be selected to be a pro footballer whereas a pro boxer you can just turn over tomorrow because you could be a journeyman right yeah so there is that aspect of it but yeah, I mean, at the highest of heights, being the best boxer, world champion, you've got to be a special type type of person because you, you're you knowingly getting into an environment where you can get really, really hurt and sometimes even killed, you know? That's what I'm saying. So you can't play boxing. No. But here's a question for you that I'd like to ask you, and I always speak to my dad about this, is that I don't understand why in Britain, boxers will turn professional at 28 years old. You go to America and Mexico, 28 years old, these people have had 50 fights. Yeah. They're turning pro at like 17, 18. How could, unless you're like Anthony Joshua, how can you really make enough money from 28 to like 35 where you can retire from it? Like if you're starting out and you're like 16 years old and you're winning fights, you're getting experience, you're earning money, you have a, a large chunk of time where you can make money. I don't understand it in in, 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 the, in in Britain where they're like turning professional at like 28 years old and it's like, oh, okay, now they're 30. Yeah. You know, what can you really do? Unless you're someone like Anthony Joshua, uh, like a brand, a marketing tool, you know, a good looking guy, clean cut. Um, and he's winning at the time. It's only recently, he's, you know, he's lost a few bouts, but how can you really do well if you're turning pro so late? maybe it's just because they feel like these people that two things one they got a calling they want to fight and and they, 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 they if they're going to fight in the street or as a doorman or as you know white collar if they feel like they can turn pro and fight and do what they love they're going to do it because they're going to probably get paid more and get more recognition for it and they've got that vanity metric of being a pro but also they might feel like there's nothing else in life for them. You know, they, they can't go into an office. They're not good at building. They're not good at football. They're not good at selling art. But what they are good at is doing Fine. this. Yeah. So may, may, maybe that's it. But yeah, I mean, it is a bit of a mad thing to turn pro later on in your life. But there are some of those very rare examples where they, they turn over late and they actually become a household name and start making a lot of money from the sport. But I think also the, the like in in America and in Mexico, there's a big thing about coaches, right? So you might be in a gym that has a certain style of boxer, mm. trainer, then you might lose a couple of fights and all of a sudden you might change trainer. Mm. In Britain, this is just me, I look at it and I've spoken to my dad who's an amateur boxing coach. It feels like to me, they all try and teach boxers the same way. Over here? Over here, yeah. Yeah, I, similarly, I, the the base of it, they all try and teach the same way, and I think that's why you know someone like Anthony Joshua and like the player, the, the boxers that do get to the top, if they start losing, there's talk. Oh, I'm going to change coach now, hmm. because in Britain they all pretty much teach you the same way. Yes and no. Fundamentally. Yeah. Yes and no. Yes and no. I mean, look, I can't speak for every single coach and I can't speak for every single club. Um, I do know there is a big difference between the amateur style of boxing to the pros. Because I, um, when I, when I, when I box, well, when I boxed when I was younger, I used to uh, uh, box for Bromley and Downham, ABC, yeah. amateur club. And they're very fencing in and out, in and out. But then when you, when you go over like sort of train with the pros, you're planting your feet and it's more like, not fencing, but more like having a real fight. Um, 
So I know that that style is very, very different. And then you, you go to certain other clubs who still maintain that, even as a pro, like a bit like fencing a little bit. More, I would say Anthony Joshua is like that, more point scoring. Yeah. But you go, then you look at someone like a Derek Jazora, who is just a fighter. A brawler, yeah, yeah. Just comes in, covers up, like has a cross cross guard like that. And he will take a few in order to get next to you and just try and try and take you out. Yeah. Um, Who's your favourite boxer then? My favourite boxer of all time... He's probably Floyd, Floyd Mayweather. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's, he's, Mate, I love he, that guy. I love he, watching him fight. It's because as a if you're if you're like a passive boxing fan, people won't understand what he does. Yeah, and he, and he's perceived as boring. I yeah. remember people watched the um, Mayweather against Pacquiao fight, which was yeah. meant to be deemed the best fight ever, and a lot of passive fans were like, "That was so boring." boring yeah. And I was like, "You don't understand what he was doing there. Yeah. He made." Manny Pacquiao, who's an incredible fighter, look a bit average. Yeah, ordinary. Yeah, and he took he took away every strength that Manny Pacquiao had because Mayweather's got this master of the defense. When you mm. can't get through someone's defense, yeah. it's just fr- frustrates yeah. him. Yeah, and then you can't do nothing about it. Yeah, you, you know, before you know it, it's like the seventh round. You're like, all I can do now is knock him out. Yeah. So he's been one of my favourites to watch because I really appreciate what he does. And that and that small little movement and blocking and stuff is just incredible. But then the other fight I really like who's completely different to him is George Groves. He's been on my podcast. Um, I love the way he very, like, stands very wide. Yeah. The power that he used to generate and also um, the, the, the jab he had is just, just mental. Like, must yeah. have been a very, very hard fighter to, to come with. He had some good against. fights, didn't he? He had some very, good fights. Very good fights. He was a, he, he, to, I mean, to be honest, I would have liked to see him fight longer. I think, yeah. he, I think he still had, I think he still got, you know, some in his tank where he could have gone, but then he had some, you know, big losses and maybe that can mess with you like mentally. He um, he damaged his arm uh, mm. after the Chris Eubank fight in that uh, Super Series tournament. And uh, he said that he was, just wasn't really the same after that. Um, obviously got beat twice by by Froch, but I only really think he got beaten yeah, the second yeah, yeah. time with that yeah. with that punch. I think the first fight he got completely robbed, and then obviously Callum Smith and he's probably made so much money that he thought I'm injured, mm-hmm. probably not going to get even better than I am now. I've made a load of dough. It's time to to leave. But I did ask him the same sort of question on my podcast, like. I really, I, I felt, I felt a little bit upset that he retired. Yeah, early, you know. Yeah, so I, I, I couldn't believe it when he did. I was like, I'm really surprised about that because I would have liked seeing him fight <coughs> James Tagal again. You know, yeah. people like that because even James Tagal and they could have just done one more fight, them two together, yeah. they would have made a serious yeah. amount of money. Yeah, exactly. And there would have been proper beef there. I, t- I tell you who I liked as well. I like Cotto as well, Cotto and I like good. his story. Yeah, you know when he got smashed up, you know, um, was it Margarita was yeah. cheating and yeah, with and the then he came, in his yeah, head. and then he came back and just like smashed him. Yeah. Like I liked that part, and I was like, he's a real warrior. You know, even when he fought Mayweather, I thought that was a really good fight. Yeah, still like he, he caused him some problems. He, yeah, causing some problems. He was disciplined as well, but I thought he, I like his style. I like the fact that he's disciplined, but he's a really tough guy as well. So I, I like him. There's a, on this note about boxing and football, there is there's so much synergy between the boxing fans, football fans. I feel like they're kind of the same. And then also like Tony Belly with Everton, yeah. uh, Ricky Hatton with Man, Man City. City yeah. There's so many like alliances. Yeah. With yeah. with the, with it's like that when football and footballers and golf, footballers and boxing. There's so much alliances. But like, I mean, I love boxing, like, especially. I mean, I look at this era is a bit, I mean, the, the era, the weight that I like now is the, the 135, that kind of weight, but the fights are just getting avoided now. And it's mm. like, if you're, if you're a boss of your brand, make the fight happen, man. Yeah. You know, I know it's a business as well. I know you got, and the, you know, as much money as you can, as quick as you can. I know you're putting your life on the line, but at some point, you know, that competition, that ego, that, you know, you want to you want to say you know what I can beat you let's mm. do it mm. um, but I think at the moment like when was it Terence Terence Crawford and um, Spence Spence like everyone wants that fight to happen and it's like now it looks like it's not gonna you know you want to see Davis fighting 
um, I don't know, Garcia or or um, Devin Haney. Haney. Like you want to see those fights, yeah. you know. That's what you, that's what boxing fans just live for. You just can't wait to see them happen. But it always seems to drag their heels, and then it it doesn't live up to what it should be. Fury and Joe, Derek Jazora free. I mean, personally for me, I'm not I, really, I don't know why this fight is even happening. Yeah, I'm not really interested the in payday, that. Payday, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. got to be. But I'm not interested in it even. You know, I'll, I'll, I'm not even going to watch the whole fight. I I'll see, I'll see the high, I'll see the highlights. Yeah. But I mean, the fights that you want to, like, oh, I'm, what do you think about Joshua? Because for me, I think, I think Joshua should have took the Fury fight. Yeah. I think he should take the fight, and I think that it, I think it would be a good fight. Yeah, I do. I do. Um, I think Fury's got got him worked out. I think he's he's just too good, too much of a world school boxer. He's yeah. a traveller. Yeah, yeah. Like these guys are fighting from from from, from the young. moment they come out of the room, yeah. they're having a tear up, right? Yeah. And they live in kind of harsh conditions yeah, some, yeah. sometimes. And and he's just so skillful, and he's too tall, you know, yeah. really six, too well, tall. He's six nine, or six, yeah, six, no, yeah, six yeah, seven, yeah. and it's then six, very seven. hard to fight anyone really, really tall. You but know? I've, he, even you know. For me, he should go for something even Wilder. I think it, I think AJ could beat Wilder. You know, obviously Wilder's got ridiculous power, and if he catches him, that's it. But he could beat him because he's fundamentally better, and that's better to have on his CV. So you can say, okay, I'll beat the guy that you beat. Now I'll come and and fight you. Yeah. Like I don't. I, I mean, I don't really understand the war. Like this, he's gonna have a warm up fight now, right? What if you lose that warm up fight? Mm. Mm. You know, what was his name Ruiz was kind of like that. You know, it was meant it was to be like, him, a, wasn't it? yeah. And it's like all of a sudden you got knocked out, and that's that's where it started because before that it wasn't the, the element of losing didn't enter his psyche. When you lose, now it's like, what if I lose? Because you know you've been beaten before. That's why when you when you say mate, everyone says, ah, oh, I can beat him, I can do this, I got the blueprint. Like remember De La Hoya was saying, oh, I got the blueprint and all that. How can you have the blueprint? He's never been beaten. He's yeah. never been knocked down. Yeah. You know, so it's it's funny, but I I really would like to see that that fight Joshua against Fury. That I will turn up to that and I'll pay money for that fight. But you know, Chisora, I I mean I I've met Chisora a few times and I really yeah, like. I like too. to be fair. I give him his flowers. He's really invented himself. He's got himself in shape. He's probably at the. He's fighting his best boxing. He's doing his best boxing now than he did at any age, because he's taking it seriously now. David Hayes like got him gave him the right back in training dietitian all that kind of stuff and he's doing really well so i love the way he reinvented himself but i just think for fury that's a different level mm, definitely well it's going to be interesting anyway, over the next few months the next few years definitely with the heavyweight boxing um last question so i came up with a mantra for my podcast or no for life my business yeah. and here's how it goes be happy never content now i've got my own interpretation of what that means so if i were to ask yourself Jay, what does be happy, never content mean to you? Um, I would say content to me sounds like just coast, accept the cars you've been given and never try and push yourself. Um, and be happy, I think is like, I would say, cherish every day you've, you, you have on this planet. Um, cherish the fact that you're healthy and enjoy time on this planet while you can lovely thank you very much for your time thank you Barbara. thank you man. it was an honor Great being to here. interview you and uh i hope the subscribers uh, have enjoyed the, the conversation so do I, and yeah. um, hopefully maybe in the future we could do a part two yeah, yeah? i'd love to i'd love to it's nice w being here wicked all right thank you very much and uh, god you. bless